Kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, warm Pacific greetings. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, staff uh, in the School of Arts, both academic and professional, to uh, students in the room, uh, and anyone else, anyone who's here this afternoon because you're interested in the humanities. I hope you find this helpful. Uh, as you might have uh, worked out uh, already, um, over the last year or so I've read five books on the value of the BA. Uh, three of them published in 2017, all of them recent. And I noticed these books and I thought something's going on, I should read these. I did. And we really don't all have time to read five books. So uh, really what I'm doing is saving you the time of reading those five books for yourself. I'm going to basically summarise what's in them. So at, at one level this is a, a flagrant and egregious act of plagiarism. Uh, I'm, I'm not even going to tell you all the time when I'm quoting someone, I'm just going to borrow their language and borrow their words uh, to convey to you what I've found in these books. Because what I think these books do is that they give us a language. They, they give us words to use that we can then deploy when we're talking to others about the value of what we do here in the, the Division of Humanities, certainly in the School of Arts, uh, whether we're teaching or studying or just interested. All of them come from the North American scene, that's a bit of a, a weakness. It would be lovely to have a book that uh, looked at the New Zealand scene and gave us Kiwi language. I haven't found one of those yet. Uh, but still, um, I hope this is helpful. So I'm going to go on and give you what I think are four domains of language that I think are of use uh, this afternoon. I have had, uh, by the way, a few apologies, and I know that some of you might need to slip out uh, a bit before the end or before the question time. I know our, our beloved Pro Vice-Chancellor has a meeting in town, so you'll be heading out the door early. Uh, but let's settle in uh, just to think about the language we might use as we talk about the value of the BA. So the first domain of language to start off with is the language of money, skills and work because there is no avoiding uh, talking about the language of money and jobs. I don't think it requires too much in the way of evidence to believe that this is a top concern for both students and their parents. In fact, it is the top concern. Recent market research by the University of Otago shows that prospective students are looking first of all for a degree that, quote, produces employable, career-ready graduates. So if we're going to convince them of the value of the BA, there is no avoiding the language of financial investment. So get, let me give you a few basic facts that are really, really good to trot out, trot out in a conversation. So here's, here's the first one. The average student loan for a BA graduate is around $25,000. Now that's the data before the government introduced its first year free fees policy. So that's likely to reduce student debt, so the, this, this data will, if anything, get even better. So a debt of around $25,000, it will take on average eight years to pay off. Over those eight years, they will earn just over $100,000 more than someone who doesn't have a degree. So there is a very nice income premium when it comes to the BA. Uh, here's some more data. On average, a university arts graduate will earn around $1.25 million more over the course of their career than someone who doesn't have a degree. That's a good bit of data as well. Uh, more locally, over 90% of Otago BA graduates are in employment or further education uh, 18 months after they graduate. And uh, you know, for those who aren't, they may have their own reasons uh, for not being in employment. So all of that um, is good news and it's important reassurance because, uh, as George Anders says, the horrifying stereotype of liberal arts majors ending up in green smocks, pouring coffee at Starbucks, has become a trope that won't go away. The myth that the best that a BA graduate can hope for is a job at McDonald's, if they can get a job at all, is just that. It's a myth. But it is a pernicious and enduring one, so much more needs to be said. The language of skills is also important. Our job, and I'm speaking as lecturers at the moment, is not to train, but to educate. And there's an important difference. 
I'm apprehensive of the idea that we are to prepare graduates who are work ready. But I am comfortable with the idea that they should be career ready. That has a longer term view, looking ahead to the many jobs a graduate might have over the course of their career, not just the first job they happen to find upon leaving university. Michael Roth laments, the current mania for driving young people into narrower and narrower domains in the name of day one job preparedness. When industrial and civic leaders call for earlier and earlier specialisation, they are putting us on a path that will make graduates even less capable citizens, who are less able to adjust to changes in the world of work. He reminds us that the most important thing is not the knowledge our graduate has learned while under our tutelage, but their facility to carry on learning through the course of their life. This is a student who is career ready. And the BA will supply them with skills that their varied employers will want. One of the best chapters in all of these books is chapter two in George Anders' book. Where is it? You Can Do Anything. It's the only book of the five that's addressed directly to students. In that chapter, Anders identifies a translation problem when it comes to an employment interview. If only the combatants could talk about their values, needs and achievements in a shared language that makes sense to each other. Employers really do want BA graduates in the skills that they bring but we struggle to articulate those skills in a language they understand. We need, he says, to champion the real world payoffs. This means translating the airy descriptions of a commencement speech into another language. The job market phrases that will help you get hired, gain greater authority and advance in your career. So he looked through more than 5,600 job adverts for jobs that had a starting salary of over $100,000 and required some form of critical thinking. And he found language that we can use. So, first of all, working the frontier. Are you highly self-directed? Can you think outside the box? Can you adapt to a changing environment? Do you thrive on challenges? So that's the language of the job interview. That word adaptability is my sort of one word summary of the quality that I think is going on in there. Uh, or the next one, finding insights. Are you naturally curious? Are you good at connecting the dots? Can you filter and distill information? Are you calm and productive in the face of ambiguity? So we might attach the word curiosity to that. Do you see how that's language? That, that we could work with if we chose to, and, and it just happens to be the language that's going to make sense uh, in a job interview. Or, choosing the right approach. Are you a problem solver? Can you act on opportunities? Can you find creative solutions? Can we trust you to make the go, no-go decisions? You might call that judgement. Reading the room. Can you build a team? Can you balance different perspectives and agendas? Can you understand the big picture? Can you manage through influence? And I might attach that to the word empathy. And finally, inspiring others. Can you inspire confidence? Can you energize others to embrace change? Are you concise and organized? Can you convey information effectively? So that's the quality of communication. All these are genuinely skills that students will gain in their BA. All he has done is to translate the skills we all recognise into the language of a job interview. Much of what Anders is talking about is critical thinking. And this is the value of any university degree. But I'd like to think it is the particular genius of the BA, which lends itself so easily to empathy and curiosity to balanced judgment and human insight. Through the BA, to quote A.G. Lafley, former CEO of Procter & Gamble, the mind develops mental dexterity that opens a person to new ideas, which is the currency for success in a constantly changing environment. 
It should enable a student to develop the conceptual, creative and critical thinking skills that are the essential elements of a well-exercised mind. Scott Hartley says the acquisition of fundamental thinking and communication skills, such as critical thinking, logical argumentation, and complex problem solving, drive the study of human nature and the nature of our communities and larger societies to investigate what makes us human. We call these soft skills in the sense that they are not governed by hard and fixed rules, not mechanical and automatic, not governed by the strict logic of an algorithm. But soft is hardly helpful language uh, to convey the rigour of these skills. And so here's my one original contribution to the afternoon. Instead of calling these soft skills, I suggest we call these human skills because they are the skills that a computer cannot offer. And they're the kind of skills that are increasingly in demand Increasingly, not in spite of a world shaped by technology, but because of it. So, to quote George Anders, though all these writers make this point, the central insight is this. The more we automate the routine stuff, the more we create a constant low-level hum of digital connectivity, the more we get tangled up in the vastness and blind spots of big data, the more essential it is to bring human judgment into the junctions of our digital lives. Fundamentally, we're social animals. And the same insight is, uh, is there in, in this cartoon that I rather like. So, so this, is, this is a mother talking to her son and the, the kind of messages that a mother might offer, you know, go and play outside, don't use that tone with me, use clean underwear, you know, all those kind of messages that a parent might pass on to their child. And then this is this boy, grown up now, a young adult at university, uh, and here are all the apps that basically do the same job, right, that, that, that fill the gap uh, that's <coughs> left by the absence of this young man's mother. Uh, and and the, point, the point I'm making in there is that we're talking about digital technology, right, but it's... It's very, very human. That, that's where it becomes real. That's where it has to be effective, at the human level. So journalist Nick Bilton, author of the 2013 book Hatching Twitter, says that tech culture is focused on solving one problem. What is my mother no longer doing for me? This is what journalist Cara Swisher has called assisted living for millennials. Those with a liberal arts background in considering the nature of human life and society, the quirks of our psyches, and the norms behind our behaviours, and who have been taught creative thinking and communication skills, are prime candidates to play leading roles in finding meaningful ways to apply the technology. And that might be beautifully engineered, but if it is not coherent in human terms, it will not succeed. So to quote Christian Marjburg, humans exist in worlds. I rather like that crisp little sentence. Humans exist in worlds. BA graduates are equipped to discern, to read, to understand those worlds. More than that, digital technology has been democratised. The task of programming an app can be relatively easily mastered even by those with no training in computer programming. And plenty of usable parts exist. You just take components that already are there and you combine them in a unique way to present a new app. The increased accessibility of technological tools is opening the field of innovation up to anyone who, with a good education and a good idea, can apply the tech to a problem that needs solving. Furthermore, technology doesn't just destroy jobs, it creates them. When the automobile was invented, it disrupted a whole range of existing jobs that had a lot to do with horses. But it developed a whole lot of other jobs in mechanical repairs, roadworks and accommodation for those who now were much more mobile. 
In the same way, technology is expanding the range of jobs that require human skills. Automation has displaced many jobs, but it cannot replace what a computer cannot do. Come up with an original idea, persuade another person to change their point of view, interpret data with human intuition, demonstrate empathy, read the room to gauge mood and influence, and understand what it is to be human. Machines will take over tasks, not jobs. In fact, they will enhance jobs by doing the routine tasks for us. Those routine tasks are ripe for automation. But non-routine, manual tasks and abstract cognitive tasks are relatively safe from automation, at least for quite some time. And that explains this lovely graph. This is from a study uh, called Humans Wanted, released by the Royal Bank of Canada in last year, 2018. That is a fantastic graph. What it does is, it, is that it ranks skills in order from those that are least vulnerable to automation down to those that are most vulnerable to auto automation. So in this age of disruption and automation, these are the skills that you want to have because they're going to be most necessary and are least vulnerable to this kind of disruption. And if you have a look at those skills, especially those in you know, the top 13 uh, or 15, uh, what have we got? We've got uh, critical thinking, reading comprehension, social perceptiveness, time management, judgment and decision making, active learning, complex problem solving, writing. They're the, they're the skills of the BA. Uh, and those skills are, are at, concentrated at that top end of skills that are least vulnerable to the disruption that's going on as a result of digital technologies uh, and computer automation. So Scott Harley, whose, whose book is called The Fuzzy and the Techie, in other words, the arts person and the technology person, is clear that we need both the fuzzy and the techie. But he also observes that the heavy emphasis on STEM subjects, that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics, has been misplaced. There is evidence to show that jobs in STEM subjects have declined as a proportion since 1980. But as our technology continues to improve, cultivating our humanity, in particular the softer skills that the liberal arts foster, will be the best way to ensure job security. There are any number of sources of data that can back all this up, but here's a report from LinkedIn that uses its own data to work out what skills were most in demand from employers in January of this year. It's an interesting report. So uh, these are the soft skills company, companies need most. Uh, they never go out of style, that's the second line. The rise of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, is only making soft skills increasingly important as they are precisely the type of skills that a robot can't automate. And that's why 50%, 57% of senior leaders say soft skills, or, or human skills, are more important than hard ones. So what are the top five? Uh, well, there's uh, creativity, right? So robots are great at optimising old ideas, uh, but organisations need creative employees. Right? So creativity. Uh, persuasion. Right, so having, having a, and this is the point, you might have a great product, but in the end, you've got to persuade humans to buy it. And to do that, you need people who understand what it is to be human and who are able to communicate uh, in ways that can be understood. Uh, collaboration, right, so teamwork and working together, that's becoming increasingly important. Adaptability, an adaptable mind is an essential tool for navigating today's ever-changing world, right? So uh, adaptability, that skill that's showing up, uh, and time management, which is, of course, a timeless skill uh, that will serve you the rest of your career. Yes, it will. So the news, the news is good. It's really good. Uh, that's just one bit of data from earlier this year, for, from you know, a credible source, uh, to back that up. But it's important to realise that the starting salary the starting job of the BA graduate is only a beginning and it may be modest. Over time, the skills of the BA prove their worth and their increasing value. 
So to quote Anders again, you didn't enrol in college or university to become the best trained candidate for a narrowly defined job. Instead, you are hunting for wide open environments that need your critical thinking capabilities. The greatest payoff for your college education is likely to be years away, perhaps in your fourth job, perhaps in your seventh. You're playing a longer game, looking for situations that reward you for being able to say, I'm an explorer, or I'm a team builder, or I'm someone who can make sense out of situations most people don't understand. Christian Mardsberg points to a 2008 study in the Wall Street Journal and to his own experience as a coach to top executives around the world. What we can take away from this data, he says, is that most STEM training will get students a good income at the starting gate and a decent career. But powerful earners, the people running the show, breaking through glass ceilings and changing the world, tend to have liberal arts degrees. After nearly 20 years of counselling the very top executives and management around the world, I can tell you that the most successful leaders are curious, broadly educated people who can read both a novel and a spreadsheet. And a final note, George Anders draws on a 2014 survey by the Gallup organisation in Purdue University in the States to show that arts graduates report higher job satisfaction. 41% of the humanities, arts and social sciences majors said they felt fully engaged by their jobs. By contrast, science majors clocked in at a slightly lower 38%, business at 37%. That isn't a gigantic gap, but it isn't a rounding error either. In other words, BA graduates will enjoy a career that doesn't just earn them money, it provides them with meaning and fulfilment. And that's important because Money isn't everything. So these books also offer us the language of citizenship and empathy. Fareed Zakaria provides us with an important history lesson. Around the 5th century BC, some Greek city-states, most notably Athens, began to experiment with a new form of government. Our constitution is called a democracy, the Athenian statesman Pericles noted in his funeral oration, because power is in the hands not of a minority, but of the whole people. This innovation in government required a simultaneous innovation in education. A flourishing democracy demands educated citizens who are capable of thinking for themselves not subject to demagogues, bureaucrats and civic authorities telling them how to think and live. Moving on a few centuries, the Roman statesman and philosopher, Cicero, gave us the term artes quae libero sunt denii, arts worthy of a free man, the liberal arts, the education of free men and women, the education that brings freedom. And this included not just those subjects that we think of today as art subjects, but also those we now categorise as science. Whatever the subject, to quote George Anders, the liberal arts train us to take full advantage of our freedom, helping us to be the most thoughtful, engaged citizens we can be. Or to quote Michael Roth, fostering ethical behaviour was at the core of the ancient Greek conception of the liberal arts. People educated in philosophical inquiry, with good communication and critical thinking skills, would be equipped for res responsibly participating in civic life. Michael Roth draws the same distinction as Cicero. The aim of technical training is to enable the student to master the present methods of earning a living in some particular way. But education, he says, is not just a tool for grooming managers not an instrument that simply equips people to play an appropriate role in the economy, not a purchase or merely a financial investment. Access to a broad, self-critical and pragmatic education has been and remains essential for a culture that prizes innovation and an economy that depends on it. It also remains essential for a society that aspires to be democratic. 
Perhaps this reflects the American focus of all these authors, but each one argues that a liberal arts education is a bulwark against tyranny and inequality. For Fareed Zakaria, that broad-based access to education creates a natural aristocracy of merit instead of an unnatural aristocracy of recycled privilege, in which the already wealthy hoard the benefits of education to themselves. Or to quote Michael Roth, citizens able to see through political or bureaucratic double talk are also workers who can defend their rights in the face of the rich and powerful. Education protects against mindless tyranny and haughty privilege. But it also does more than that. A liberal arts education helps us to understand the other. And in a pluralistic society, uh, that is critically important. Roth continues, at its best, education develops the capacities for seeing possibilities and for relishing the world across borders we might otherwise not have dared to cross. Education must lead us beyond these borders if it is to be more than training for a role that has already been allocated to us by the powers that be. And the word for this is, of course, empathy. A liberal arts education involves really understanding how the other person sees the world, even if their position is nonsense to us. Teachers don't just impart skills for specific tasks. They also guide students to think allegorically and to puzzle out the diverse ways in which people give significance to their lives. This is learning as overcoming blindness. When we learn to read or look or listen intensively, we are not just becoming more adept at uncovering yet more examples of the duplicities of culture and society, we are partially overcoming our own blindness by trying to understand something from another's point of view. Christian Mardsberg places empathy at the core of his book. If we want to say something meaningful about another culture, we have to let go, just a little bit, of the biases and assumptions that form the scaffolding of our own culture. When we commit to losing a part of ourselves, we gain something profoundly new in exchange. We gain insight. I call the practice of cultivating these types of insights sense-making. We like to think of ourselves as autonomous individuals, but we are all of us embedded in social contexts. If we all exist in worlds, a liberal education helps us to understand those worlds, even, and especially, when they are different from our own. If you truly want to understand the people in your world, you must engage with them at eye level. If you really want to understand something about a culture, the trick is to see its ghosts, its artistic heritage, its history, its customs. There is no better training ground for a perspective of human experience. This is surely what the humanities are all about. We immerse, our, we immerse our students in what it means to be human. When they read a novel, they place themselves in another life. When they study history, they see the world in a different time and place. When they pursue sociology or anthropology, they come to perceive humans in their groups and social interactions in another light. The list goes on. This is what we do. Our students encounter the human experience. In doing so, they cultivate empathy, and empathy is what we need in a democratic society. And one final thought here. Michael Roth sees two interweaving threads in a liberal arts education that he calls the philosophical and the rhetorical. The, philo the philosophical thread is sceptical, focused on inquiry and critical thinking. The rhetorical thread is reverential focused on bringing new members into the common culture. We need both. And we should be wary of focusing only on inquiry and critical thinking. A spirit of inquiry is only one aspect of a well-rounded education, and its overemphasis can lead to sterility rather than creativity. If we teach our students only how to critique and only how to deconstruct, and if we operate only from a hermeneutic of suspicion, we risk taking scepticism too far and winding up contributing to a cultural climate that has little tolerance for finding or making meaning, whose intellectuals and cultural commentators delight in being able to show that somebody else is not to be believed. 
If that happens, we give our students only reasons to be guarded, reasons not to learn, and that will inhibit empathy, not nurture it. Humanity study has been good at helping our students to create a critical distance from the context or culture they are studying. We have been less interested in investigating with our students how we generate the values we believe in or the norms according to which we go about our lives. In other words, we have been less interested in showing how we make a norm legitimate than in sharpening our tools for delegitimation. So I'm only quoting Michael Roth who's talking about the North American scene. I'm not saying that that's what we do here at Otago. But I am drawn to Roth's encouragement to cultivate in our students a respect for the old and a place for that reverential side of a liberal arts education. Our task is to form not just critics, but citizens and explorers. Oh, I had that phrase there. So we have the language of freedom and exploration. Education, again, says Roth, should enhance our capacities, not reduce us to mere tools. Who wants to attend school to learn to be human capital for the latest investment schemes? Who really aspires for their children to become mere resources for somebody else's purpose? Therefore, schools first and foremost should teach us habits of learning. In this way, a liberal arts education truly does become the education that brings freedom, says Scott Harley. A liberal education is not so much about learning to do a job, as it is about learning to learn and to love learning. It is both about intellectual adventure and about building the fundamental intellectual skills that equip students to continue to pursue new interests for the rest of their lives. And that is why George Anders likes the metaphor of students as explorers. One of the central elements of a liberal arts education is wanting to work on the frontier. Our task is, to quote the Yale report of 1828, to equip students with the discipline and furniture of the mind, the habits of thinking on which a lifetime of learning will be erected. To return to Michael Roth's twofold distinction, a liberal education intertwines the philosophical and rhetorical so that we learn how to learn, so that we continue both inquiry and cultural participation throughout our lives because learning has become part of who we are. In our classrooms, students become more fully formed. Education is for human development, human freedom, not the moulding of an individual into being, a being, into a being who can perform a particular task. This is as much about self-discovery as it is anything else. Education should help students to reshape themselves, to rework the self-image foisted on them by their past, the self-image that makes them competent citizens, into a new self-image that they themselves have helped to create. Learning in the process of living is the deepest form of freedom. If we think that all this is uh, indulgent, self-indulgent and individualistic, it's not. It's in the service of larger causes. Liberal arts graduates work on the frontiers to find solutions for pressing human problems. Scott Harley makes this point really well. So I'm, I'm going to read a, a full two paragraphs out of his book. He says, The humanities and social sciences are devoted to the study of human nature and the nature of our communities and larger societies. Students who pursue degrees in the liberal arts disciplines tend to be particularly motivated to investigate what makes us human, how we behave and why we behave as we do. They're driven to explore how families and our public institutions, such as our schools and legal systems, operate and could operate better, and how governments and economies work, or as is often the case, are plagued by dysfunction. These students learn a great deal from their particular courses of study and apply that knowledge to today's issues the leading problems to be tackled, and various approaches for anal analysing and addressing those problems. The greatest opportunities for innovation in the emerging era are in applying evolving technological capabilities to finding better ways to solve human problems like social dysfunction and political corruption.
finding ways to better educate children, helping people live healthier and happier lives by altering harmful behaviours, improving our working conditions, discovering better ways to tackle poverty, improving health care and making it more affordable, making our governments more accountable from the local level up to that of global affairs, and finding optimal ways to incorporate intelligent, nimble machines into our work lives so that we are empowered to do more of the work that we do best and to let the machines do the rest. Workers with a solid liberal arts education have a strong foundation to build on in pursuing these goals. And his book contains story after story of arts graduates who have done just that. They have set out with the skills that they have to improve the world around them. And we need more of these graduates. Lifelong learners, innovative thinkers, courageous pioneers, visionary explorers. Christian Marsberg says, the hardest problems of the coming century are cultural. This is where arts graduates come into their own. This is creativity at its most masterful. It is the very act of opening up new worlds, of revealing entirely new ways of being in the world. And that has the potential to enhance the world. And so finally, the language of meaning values and character. And I recognise that this kind of language might cause apprehension. As members of the university, we can all agree on the priority of research. We're unlikely to reach wholesale agreement on our values, let alone meaning. The goal, says Michael Roth, is not to discover some ultimate truth. And I agree, and I'm not proposing that we try. Even so, there is something to say. It goes to the central questions of our endeavour. What does it mean to be human? How do we experience ourselves in the world? Where does meaning come from? If we are, at least partly, in the business of human formation, we have to reflect on the kind of human we are trying to form. It is Roth who has most to say about this, so let's work with him for a moment. He takes us back to the new model of a research university developed in Germany during the 19th century. Universities would serve Wissenschaft, scientific knowledge, and this meant that they had to be bastions of free inquiry. The mission of the modern university was only to create new knowledge, and it did so by promoting research. Universities in the English-speaking world followed the German lead. As they detached themselves from their Protestant heritage, and as scientific work became increasingly specialised in universities, researchers tended to avoid debates about the meaning of education and the formation of character. There was no longer any need for an overarching shared moral framework. That, of course, released enormous potential for instrumental gains in improving human material conditions through pure research. But for Roth, this inheritance risks emphasising the philosophical dimension of the liberal arts education at the expense of the rhetorical. In contemporary higher education, the philosophical tradition has resulted in an emphasis on inquiry and critical thinking, learning to develop as an autonomous person by shedding illusions and acquiring knowledge through research. But the spirit of critique is only one aspect of a well-rounded education, and its overemphasis can lead to sterility rather than creativity. He quotes Daniel Gilman, the first president of Johns Hopkins University. The object of the university is to develop character, it misses its aim if it produces learned pedants, or simple artisans, or stunning sophists, or pretentious practitioners. Its purport is not so much to impart knowledge to the pupils as whet the appetite, exhibit methods, develop powers, strengthen judgment, and invigorate the intellectual and moral forces. It should prepare for the service of society a class of students who will be wise, thoughtful, progressive guides in whatever department of work or thought they may be engaged. Gilman's language sounds antiquated now, but there is something to the thought. It is what Roth calls a practical idealism. A liberal education should help us to develop the intellectual and moral capacities to imagine a future that is worth striving for and enhance our ability to create the tools for its realisation. I'm certainly not going to prescribe the kind of character or values that we should strive for, but a liberal arts education is so fundamental to the whole person that we cannot set the whole person aside. 
these questions are going to come into play precisely because of the value of the BA. It inevitably prompts the student to reflect on the kind of person they hope to be and the kind of society in which they want to live. So those are, those are the, the four domains of language. I want to think now in the remainder of how we might put them to work. And as I, as I do that, I'd like us to think about our, our prospective students, our current students, and the graduates that we're seeking to produce. So, first of all, our, our prospective students. The university recently completed some market research into prospective students and their parents and formulated five typologies. So here we go. As they, as they interviewed and surveyed and, and uh, workshopped with these potential students, there were these five typologies, these five type of prospective students. And each type kind of prioritises a slightly different set of values. Uh, that they're looking for in a degree. Uh, and so you can see them. I'll describe them in a moment. Uh, positive contributors, respect seekers, determined careerists, self-discoverers, focused academics. Now, uh, what the university did was to um, work out which, which degrees showed up in the top five for these types. And you'll notice that the, the BA didn't show up for respect seekers uh, or focused academics in the top five. So let me just explain what's going on. Um, focused academics are those who want to challenge themselves academically and advance their knowledge and expertise in their so chosen subject. And the respect seekers are those who want to gain the respect of their family. So their lack of interest in the humanities is probably a reflection of the entrenched myths around the BA. I'm not sure those young respect seekers would approach their parents with much confidence to announce that their preferred course of study was an arts degree, given that mythology. And the same mythology helps to explain why humanities is only fourth on the list among the determined careerists. If we were able to challenge the myths, and we can, we might be able to speak to the focused academics and the respect seekers, but that could be more than we can hope for now. We can more profitably address the three typologies in which the humanities does register. And these five books have given us the language that we need. So to begin with, we can speak to the determined careerists. So they are driven by the desire to have financial and job security and a well-paying career. And we have a good story to tell. We can give them that basic data. $1.25 million over the course of their career, an income premium of over $100,000 while they pay off a loan of only $20,000. These simple facts offer enormous reassurance to prospective students. You will find a job. You will earn money. The BA is a very good financial investment. You may have to cope with the unsettling psychology of the BA. Because there will be so many jobs available to you, for now you lack the security that comes with knowing exactly what job you'll be heading into. But that's an advantage. It means your options are wide open, not narrow and fixed in an age of disruption and automation, when work as we know it is constantly changing. To quote the philosophical writer Eric Hoffer, in times of drastic change, it is the learners who are near at the future. The learned usually find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. And you need to realise that the skills of the BA prove their enduring worth over time, that your first job is only your first job. Your starting salary may be in no great resemblance to that figure of 1.25 million, but the skills you have gained set you up for a successful career because you can see things in a new light. You know how to learn. You are comfortable with flexibility, adaptability, and ambiguity, and above all, you understand what it is to be human. We can speak to the self-discoverers. They want the opportunity to better understand themselves and what they want out of life. They want to develop broad skills that can be used throughout their life. Oh, welcome to the BA. Uh, that is why we can't leave out the language of meaning, character and values. That kind of language will reach these students. Because the BA so deeply engages with what it is to be human, it is their ideal opportunity to reflect on the deep questions of human existence and to pay attention to their own formation. It helps them not just to make a living, but to make a life. This is the liberal arts, the education that brings freedom. These three years are a special season of exploration and self-discovery. 
students encounter other ways of seeing the world that will expand their horizons and help them to find their place in it, a place they might not even know it existed, a place that might surprise and delight them. To bring back Michael Roth, learning to see and hear for oneself, acquiring the capacity to acknowledge meaning to which one had previously been blind, is one of the great gifts of liberal education. And we can speak to the positive contributors. They are driven by a desire to make a positive impact on people's lives. They want to make a greater contribution to society and give back to others. The BA equips students to understand people, to understand humans as individuals and in their various groups. Can you imagine a better foundation? BA graduates really can change the world. That was exactly Scott Hartley's point. We now have at our disposal the benefits of digital technology that in the right hands can be put to use for the betterment of society. We can offer these students the language of big problems, big ideas, big solutions. All of these anchored in a sophisticated understanding of what it means to be human in our 21st century globalised world. Even if that doesn't involve digital technology, there are plenty of vocations that will draw this out of our graduates. And if they are well-rounded global citizens, they will enhance the world around them, wherever they go. Well, so much for our prospective students, we could think more briefly about our graduates. And it is the question of first importance. What kind of graduate are we seeking to produce? The university, of course, has answered that question in the graduate attributes and as I've read these books I've come to actually a new appreciation for these attributes because they clearly capture a lot of what the BA is about so you know global perspective interdisciplinary perspective lifelong learning communication cultural understanding ethics self-motivation teamwork you know all of those attributes have showed up in these books in the kind of way in which they have formulated the value of what we're doing. So uh, these graduate attributes that I, I suspect we tend to ignore for the most part are actually uh, surprisingly helpful in orienting us uh, in what we're about and in giving us language that we can use uh, to describe the value of what we do. And finally we can talk to our current students, of which just possibly I think there are a few in the room. Welcome. Uh, good to have you. Uh, let me talk to you for a moment. First of all, I want to uh, commend your courage and determination because you chose the BA. You may well have made that uh, choice in the face of deep reservations from your parents, the scepticism of your friends and doubts that you made, uh, I'm sorry, and your own doubts that might have made you just a little apprehensive about whether you were making a good choice. I hope you have a renewed confidence that you have made a good choice. You can relax. It will be okay. Make the most of your study while you're here. Grab hold of the benefits that the BA offers you. Understand what they are. Nurture them and pursue them. Think of yourselves as explorers. What does it take to be on the frontier? It requires the courage that compelled you to choose the BA in the first place. It tests your resilience. It demands an acceptance of discomfort and uncertainty as you chart a path that has never been charted before. To quote George Anders, take a close look at how liberal arts graduates make their way towards winning careers, and you will see that gritty paths are common. Success isn't a straight line. Getting a bachelor's degree in English, psychology, history, anthropology, or other liberal arts disciplines doesn't guarantee you a, predict a predictable job at amalgamated history industries for the next 40 years. You will need to keep improvising your future, and that's all right. You may switch cities two or three times in your 20s. You may switch employers five or six times. Each cycle of change expands your skills, your horizons, and your intuition for what should come next. You become both student and teacher, able to define opportunities that others can't see. In other words, the benefits of the BA won't come to you if you sit here like a lump. The figure of 1.25 million is an average. Some are far above it, some are far below it. That is largely in your hands. And hold us to account. If we, your lecturers, are not doing all we can to realise the potential of the BA, then you should make that known. So, to speak uh, to the lecturers among us, 
uh, in the course of the last 50 minutes, we've, accumulating, we've accumulated some language. And we can now start to use it. So, so what have we got? Uh, we've got the language of the job interview. We've got these, these quiet five questions of, of George Anders. We've got the words that uh, I came up with to try and capture what was going on behind each of those five. Uh, we've got these other skills that have come up along the way. Creativity, collaboration, time management, persuasion. We've got some good orienting questions. What does it mean to be human? How do we experience ourselves in the world? Where does meaning come from? We've got these kind of phrases. Lifelong learners, innovative thinkers, courageous pioneers, visionary explorers, wise, thoughtful, progressive guides. Ways of understanding the graduates that we're producing. We can use the language of big problems, big ideas, big solutions. And all those graduate attributes that we could bring in that also have language that we can use to describe what we do. And then there's a whole lot of language that I just really liked on the way through. I mean, what are some of my favourites? Working the frontier, discipline and furniture of the mind, a well-exercised mind, opening up new worlds, relishing the world across borders. There's a whole lot of language, right? We can use it. So I think our fundamental task is to make the implicit explicit. So when we set an essay for our students, we can explain why an essay has value. I don't know if we ever do this. Maybe we assume that an essay is just self-evidently valuable. But we could make that explicit to our students and say that an essay is an exercise in problem solving, time management, logical argument, and clear communication. A group assessment develops skills in teamwork and collaboration. The personal skills of productively getting along with others whose personality flaws drive us to distraction. So we should never miss an opportunity explicitly to name the skills our students are developing as they develop them. We could formulate consistent language in our course outlines. It doesn't just describe the assessment we set our students, it also articulates why we have set it and names the skills we seek to enhance. That will remind us of what we're about and inform students of the value of the humanities from the very beginning of their degree. Above all, we should never forget that the greatest gift we can give our students is a love of learning and the skill of learning how to learn. How did that happen for us? How did that happen for you? What brought us alive to the love of learning? And how can we nurture that in our own students? So now that we have this language, we should use it. And we can use it with confidence. We need to rest back our mojo. I think that over the last decade, we lost our confidence. No one took it from us. We gave it up, and we can take it back. We have been daunted for too long. Whatever language we use to articulate the value of the humanities, we should speak with confidence and authority. This stuff matters, because some things fundamentally never change, even in a new world of technology, automation and disruption. As Christian Marsberg says, any broad-based education in the humanities shows us that nothing changes everything. Whether it is power dynamics, family strife, the rise and fall of great empires, our relationship to the gods or our experience of falling in love, the ideas and stories and artistic works on offer in the humanities are always relevant. Our own human yearning for love, for knowledge, for purpose and for excellence is never new, which is precisely why it never gets old. And that's why the Bachelor of Arts degree will always have value. So to end with how Michael Roth ends his book, the free inquiry and experimentation of a reflexive, pragmatic education helps us to think for ourselves, take responsibility for our beliefs and actions, and become better acquainted with our own desires, our own hopes. Liberal education matters far beyond the university because it increases our capacity to understand the world, contribute to it, and reshape ourselves. When it works, it never ends. Thank you.
So we have some time for questions. If you need to slip out, though, this is, this is your chance. Gwyneth's got the microphone. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, or indeed offer your own reflection, because there's a lot of wisdom in the room, a lot of experience, and uh, if you would like to contribute to the discussion, um, by all means. Thank you for a very rich talk, Tim. Um, when Grant Robertson did his important study of the future of work in New Zealand, he came to similar conclusions that the routine jobs would be taken over by computers, and he ended up with a list, not as comprehensive of yours, but of skills. But he didn't pin it to a liberal arts degree, so please could you send him a copy of your talk? <laughs> <laughs> I might. I might. Oh, do please that. do. Yeah, please okay. do, because yeah. I think it's a, it's it's a great marketing tool for the government as well. Okay. And just Cinder Ardern did say yes. There's STEM STEM courses, but if you put an A for arts in there, then you get yeah. STEM power. STEM. Yes, the power of STEM. Exactly right. Yeah. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Tim. Um, I actually have two questions, so I hope I can have sort of two bites at this. Uh, they're completely different. Um, what one is to do with uh, how we bridge uh, from you know students coming out of school and NZQA yeah. into the BA, because I'm finding increasingly that I'm understanding less and less of where my students are coming from, and so yeah. I'm really curious as to yeah. what I need, to, how my imagination needs to change in order to yeah, meet. Yeah. Yeah. the assumptions that my students are coming in with. And the completely different question is, um, th there's a lot of quite, uh, you know, very valuable, but quite generic things here. And I'm wondering what there is, I mean, you, you mentioned the history of the, um, you know, the German university in the 19th century. What are the disciplinary commonalities that actually bind us together as a school? I mean, as a school, we've kind of come into existence almost by accident in some ways, We're, uh, not entirely. But I'm wondering whether part of the um, task that we have is to identify the things uh, within the different disciplines that teach the BA, um, what they actually have in common in disciplinary terms. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So two yep. completely different yeah. questions, do with them what you like. Well, yeah. no, they're good. Thank you, James. Um, so, so on the first one, understanding NCA, uh, uh, it's, it's really, really, really important that we understand NCA yeah. uh, and, the, and the formation that our, our first year students have had in that system. Because if, if we don't understand that, we tend to blame our students, I think, for the inadequacies that really aren't theirs. It's the, it's the way they've been formed. And so Stephen Scott does really good work uh, on uh, understanding NCA and translating it for students. Uh, there was a presentation we had uh, a year or two ago, there must be a copy somewhere um, on the website, uh, f from a, the principal at, then at John McGlashan, who, who explained NCEA for us and, and the differences between how NCEA is, is framed and, and our own way of educating. So, so that's the first thing, yeah, is, is we need to recognise that because they really are quite different. Um, the, second, the second thing is, oh, it's almost to make the same point uh, as I've made today, we need to make things explicit. And I really, I, I, maybe I'm just, maybe this is just me, uh, and I just haven't done a good job of this over the years, of realising that when students come into my classroom for the first time, they may not necessarily know why I'm setting an essay for them. I mean, wh what's going on with an essay? Why, why am I doing that? Why do I think it has value? I don't think I've ever really articulated that for my students, so that they know the value of what they're doing. And if we articulate that, I think that will bring to the surface the kind of differences that are there between the, the instinct, if you like, of NCEA and what we're trying to do in bringing them to independent critical thinking. Uh, so if, if we're explicit about what we're doing to our students, I think that will help them to understand the, the new system they're in. But, so that, that's that first question. The second thing is, uh, what binds us together? So, to, I mean, obviously this is a School of Arts event, because I'm, I'm head of the School of Arts. Uh, but I've been talking about the BA, which is taught through the whole division. And obviously we have the School of Social Sciences as well. Uh, one, one way of approaching it is, uh, you know, what, what makes us not social scientists? Uh, and, and, and what's left is what holds us together. And I think that does make us distinctive. And I, I quite like 
the arrangement that we have in terms of the programs we've got. On one level, it is arbitrary. You know, we, we could have configured things in a different way. We could have created four smaller schools instead of two bigger ones. But then you really would have a, a school of what's left over. Uh, to have a, have a school of arts, I think, I think there is something in there that holds us together. It's, it's, not, the, it's not the social science methodology uh, or way of thinking, I think. It, it, I don't know if, I can, if I'm being even positive and constructive by saying it's the absence of something. Uh, so you know, what is it that holds our disciplines together uh, will be the, well, the kind of generic skills I'm talking about. The, the dealing with texts, I think, would be a common denominator. Uh, across a lot of our programs. Um, understanding what it is to be human in, in other contexts from our own, so history or classics uh, take us into other contexts. English, you know, the novel that I mentioned. Um, you know, theology will take us into a, another way of thinking about what it is to be human. Uh, so, so those things, I think, hold us together. And I, I mean, I love your question, James, because I'd love us to keep doing this sort of thinking. Right. What, what is it that holds us together as a school? What, what a great question. You know, thank you for asking it, James. Okay, Tim, thank Dave. you for that. Um, anyone who's willing to read five books for me, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, and in terms of a sort of thought experiment, if there was someone in the room who we will call Bachelor of Science, and or Bachelor of, of Commerce, and they're thinking, well, you guys don't really have exclusive rights or exclusive claim or monopoly over these skills or over these attributes. Yep. And they would report to us, um, and I just did this quickly, that our graduate attributes include leadership, communication, ethical responsibility, global respective, these are BCOM, BSci, multidisciplinary perspective, time management, well-developed oral and written communication skills. I was waiting for a laugh there. Um, and <laughs> Oh, there's uh, irony. <laughs> yeah, okay. And teamwork. Yeah. So the question is, what would, what would you or the authors you've read say in response yep. to that um, yep. challenge? If you Great question. I would say that's exactly right. Uh, we, don't have a, we, we don't have a monopoly on this. What I'm getting at, though, is the idea out there that the BA is somehow not this. Right? It's, you, 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 somehow people appreciate the idea, I don't know how they get it, that if you know, you're going to go and study commerce, you're going to earn some money. Right? Somehow, uh, if you're going to go and study science, it's going to be helpful to society. But when they look at the BA, they think, well, you know, what use is that? It's bugger all. Right? I mean, that's what we're up against. So, so, so it's not that I'm really making a statement about those other degrees, because they'll, they'll have truth too. There's an, there's an income premium for anyone who comes to university and gets a degree. I mean, part of the, part of the thing we need to be saying at the moment uh, is coming, getting a degree is still a really financially good thing to do in your life. So I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put myself up against you know, those other degrees, because this is true. Or, what I'm trying to do is say, why, why is the BA not understood in the same way? And, well, I'm saying let's, you know, let's change what we can control, which is how we talk about it. So let's, let's develop some language. And, and having developed it, let's use it. And let's use it with confidence. Because what we do is really good really good and it's really good for our students and it's good for our society i think and so you know i'm going to say that and and these books gave me some language that i can use to get all polemical yeah gwyneth who have we got next oh uh, just a moment I'll, we'll come to you next rachel thank you i um really appreciate what you had to say i think what's missing as a current student yeah is that I'm in my fourth year and I'm terrified. The world of work, as much as these figures may um, yeah. kind of seek to reassure me, yeah, yeah, yeah. is terrifying. Yeah. Um, and I don't think actually the loss of confidence is something that I've done myself. Right. Um, I actually think I'm very confident in these attributes. I'm very confident in the skills that I've gained from my BA. What the loss of confidence is that my law students 
friends, they all have paid internships this summer. Yeah. My um, loss of confidence was the, um, the School of Art History, you know, Art History Program. That was a loss of confidence. These yeah. external factors are actually a part of um, how students are losing confidence in the BA yeah. and, um, and, and scared about the job market. So yeah. what do you say to students who are feeling actually overwhelmed and afraid wow. as much as this is fantastic yeah. and what we totally agree with as well? Yeah. Well, thank you for your courage um, in, in, in sharing that. Thank you. And that's super helpful to hear. Super, super helpful. Um, I, and let me just let me just pick out a, a, a few things. Uh, first of all, we have a, a really, really, really good careers advisory service. Petra is sitting over there. She's taken the time to come and hear this. Uh, you know, and and they are they are there and very committed to uh, our division and to our students and to helping you prepare your way. Uh, for the job market and they're developing a new scheme that will start in second year will take 12 months to mentor you give you some basic skills some basic orientation so that when you get to this point in your degree you're actually got some assurance so uh, you know I think the university uh, it, it, we all collectively have a responsibility to understand exactly what you've just said and try and speak to it uh, just at the point you, you need that. So, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, the, the loss of confidence, I was talking there to those of us in the, uh, in, on the academic staff uh, who also can look back on the last few years and point to some very hard moments. Uh, that, that, and I'm not, I'm not denying the reality of those moments, but I'll, I'll say something really carefully, uh, very, very carefully. How we frame those things we, we do have some agency. I, I, I just don't want to dis... I'm worried that we become disempowered uh, and that we think, you know, these, these big forces are, are just beyond our control. Uh, well, to a large extent they are. You know, the decline in the humanities is a, is a Western phenomenon by and large, right? It's certainly not Otago. It's certainly not just New Zealand, right? But in, in the face of that, I don't want, I don't want us to be disempowered. And I do want us to see that we have agency. We have agency in how we frame our experience. Every human has that. And we have agency in terms of the language we use. And so today, I've just gone after this little component of, of, of what, we can, what we can say to ourselves, to our students, and to others. Um, but I don't want to deny the, the, the heaviness of what you just said and the reality of that. I really don't. Thank you. Many of the terms which you have used, um, adaptability, creativity, critical thinking, are under analysis these days in much greater detail. And looking at humanity, maybe the focus of humanities is on the human perspective, for instance. Yeah. And so the question of what a human is, is really essential to that um, enterprise. And that, of course, is the centre of the Anthropocene. There's a pan-European research project, which was reported here in a seminar just a few months ago, which has been looking at that definition, which is crucial for all sorts of legal things and other things like that. Right. And that's come up with the conclusion that they, all of these delineations they've found have faltered at the moment. So do we have to go back and start looking more carefully at some of these terms we've used to actually tease out the detail of what you actually mean by those terms and take that more carefully and in more depth than we have? Uh, uh, undoubtedly. Um, and, you know, we're academics. So, you know, uh, those of us who are academics, uh, we, you know, instinctively, that's, that's what we'll do. Um, and, you know, let's go there. Sure, let, let's, let's be precise, let's be disciplined, let's be rigorous in our thinking and in the language we use. Uh, but as a starting point, let's, let's develop some language we can use uh, and then go on and think more deeply about it. So I guess today was phase one. What you've described um, is, is phase two. Uh, and being informed in the way that you've suggested is a great way to go. Yeah, thank you. So we are going to finish at quarter past, so we might make this the last question. Um, thank, you. Thank, thank you, that was great. Um, I'm just probably preaching to the converted, but just making the point that there's also an element of us making spaces for the kinds of things we do. And I'm just 
as I guess some others of us will be going across to the Hutton for the arts and culture seminar that the mural candidates are going in. And it's quite important for us to engage with people and, and the community yeah. and say, yeah. these are the things that we're interested in. These, yeah. these humanities things yeah. are part of our everyday life. They're mm -hmm. not sort of, they're not nice to haves, they're not add-ons. And so there's a kind of responsibility on us to, yeah. to proselytise, I guess. Yeah. Well, you. yeah, you're, 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 you're exactly right. Uh, that's, that's part of what I'm, I'm saying. Let, let's, be in, let's be confident. Let's be outward looking. Let's be engaged. And when we engage, you know, here's, here's language that we can put to use um, to try and open up the space for the humanities. So, so thank you. And thank you all for coming and staying till quarter past five. I appreciate your time and, you know, go well. Thank you. <laughs>